So thanks again for taking time to discuss the Interfaith Giving Circle. I'm really excited to continue the conversations that we've had. Um, for those that do not have um, access to the previous meeting minutes or the discussions that we have um, held previously, I will share the document link in the chat for everyone and we'll momentarily also share my screen. So I know we had a lot of discussion on the wordsmithing um, around the about us and purpose of the group in the last discussion. So we decided to just have it be more generally focused on interfaith as opposed to confronting hate uh, which is uh, always good to have feedback and suggestions. And that's why we have these conversations um, to see what resonates with people. And we will um, kind of work in this document together today. And the main areas that I'd like to see us focus on are some of the logistics in terms of leadership, timeline, and membership. Um, so would love to hear your thoughts if you um, are looking at the document or following along on the screen, um, just kind of catching up from where we ended last conversation. Um, if anybody would like to kind of roundtable discussion, and then we can try to focus on those key areas after that. Well, in response to your comment that you sent uh, previously, I think, uh, was it religious liberty? I think, you know, that that's fine with me, but I didn't want to weigh in on that until the group kind of met just to let, you know, folks uh, decide what best it works for me. Hey, Muhi, I could just uh, say that um, when you say, uh, when you're using the word religious, so I guess it depends on what, uh, how, how inclusive you want to be, because religious does not include humanists, atheists, and agnostics. So um, kind of depending on what you really want to, how you really want to convey that and how inclusive we want to be. So uh, it could be belief. You could like substitute the word religious with some sort of like belief or something like that. Um, but I'm just, I guess it depends on how, you know, how, how really you want to delve into that and uh, inclusive we want to be. So would the term, would the term just pluralism without the word religious work or Rod, does that, does that still get into the issue that you mentioned? I mean, religious liberty, by the way, is not without its own political baggage uh, in some circles domestically these days too, but, but maybe pluralism also addresses the, the humanist concern. Yeah, um, I, you know, in some sense, religious liberty is like guaranteed in the constitution, right? So we're supposed to all have that and that the country was founded on that and so on, but, but it's simply in reality, it's not there for everyone. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think pluralism, I, I think pluralism basically can, is often misunderstood by conservatives. I think it to mean universalism and other kinds of things. Right. So, right. um, but it, right. you know, well, yeah, we want to stay away from all those, from all those, uh, uh, symbol terms that get, that are going to put people off. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like Liberty, you know, like who, who, who doesn't want Liberty? <laughs> you know? Like that's a good word. <laughs> I mean, what about, um, uh, what about promoting equity, mutual appreciation, respect, and inclusivity? I don't know. Something like that. It's very does, John Hickian. Does inclusivity have the same, have the same resonance with the folks you have in mind, Rod? 
Uh, you know, um, it, it might it might be so wide open that religious groups are wondering, do we want to be part of this, right? So, exactly. conservative yeah. religious groups, right? Like, is this a, is this an interfaith thing, or is it just a human thing, or I don't know. I mean, not sure. I. The name of the group is what? Interfaith, right? The name of the giving circle, I mean. So I don't know how 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 uh, inclusive do we want it, right? Or what's the what are the boundaries around around it? It's like a really important question. Does, does interfaith intentionally mention faith and therefore is a part of our, our identity here? Yeah. And with such a name, it seems it would be some kind of faith, you know, which, I mean, I suppose agnosticism is a form of faith too, <laughs> you know, but. Uh... Well, right. I mean, I have a lot of friends that do interfaith work that are atheists. I have several friends actually. Um, you know, so yeah. it's just, I, I guess it's just a question of semantics and how inclusive we want to ensure we sound and ensure that we can bear. But at the same time, you know, it's hard not to get caught up in those uh, minor details. Yeah, I think Interfaith Youth Corps is another one. You know, in, yeah, Interfaith Youth Corps, right? IFYC, they mm -hmm. also in, are very inclusive and it, yet it's an interfaith thing. So so I, I don't think if, if uh, atheists and agnostics are joining interfaith discussions and so on, then I don't think religious liberty should put them off. They, they need liberty just as much as anyone else to pr practice their atheism or agnosticism or whatever, right? I think we could put it in our values you know, statement that we, it's not just for, you know, it's whoever, um, so I don't think I, I, I wouldn't want to um, uh, drown out the message of, you know, in faith. Um, I right. think we should be in, in, inclusive and accepting of all. You don't have to be a person of faith to be part of this. But I think we are trying to focus on something that I don't think um, is funded as often, right? The faith communities and stuff like that. So I wouldn't right. want to drown out. Uh, what we are going to focus on by trying to be, and I, you know, okay, I, I'm all about DEI, but um, in, in that same respect, um, you know, I don't want to drown out the message of religious communities because I don't think they get highlighted enough and they don't get funded enough for the good work that, uh, you know, all the different communities are doing. So I think we can put it that we are interfaith, intrafaith, and you know, so it could be part of the messaging, but I don't think we should shy away from it. Agreed. And so just to be clear, when we talk about qualified um, organizations, focus areas, those are those are groups that we'll be granting to. That's a good point, Lord. Um, so yeah, we were focused, this is, for organizations who could end up applying to a giving circle. Um, so that's a good clarifying point. So then I guess then my second, then my, the follow up question, um, who, who, are, who are our target members to be a part of the circle? I, I, I think those two kind of have to reflect, reflect one another. That yeah. Yeah, so target member demographic, we were talking about national, regional, and local faith-based leaders. Um, so, you know, stand on that as well. Um, perhaps this is Sayeda uh, from the Hub Foundation. Perhaps we could also make a, I don't know, a category in terms of the target um, leadership to also be the organizing, you know, youth or, you know, some kind of engagement from some kind of representative that may not be, 
necessarily the leader of an organization or a priest or a rabbi or imam, but someone that could maybe serve in the role as, you know, the point person, the organizer, the mobilizer, someone that can rally um, communities along within that faith community? So how would you uh, want to rephrase that as like a target member demographic, say the, is it showcasing um, people who are like, you know, involved in various levels or? Faith community, active faith community leader, or I mean, maybe not even the youth component at this point, because we're first trying to set a precedent, but um, maybe community um, exemplary community leadership or, or community, um, community leadership uh, representative or community representative or faith community rep. I don't know exactly, but something along the lines of a representative from that specific faith community that is already stellar, that's already known, and they are famous for being a mobilizer, but they don't hold an official title. Sure. Maybe informal, I'm just brainstorming out loud, maybe informal um, faith mobilizer. Maybe we could put a like a, a community leaders that are dedicated to interfaith, you know, um, practices or something like that. Because I know a lot of people that are have no standing in their own faith communities or whatever that do interfaith work and are community leaders or, um, you know, leaders in their maybe um, racial or ethnic communities and that represent a race but are, like I said, have no standing. So more yeah. community leaders that are dedicated to interfaith practices or something like that where, because I know my community has a lot of lay leaders, right? <laughs> um, there's not a lot of assigned leadership roles uh, within our faith community. So um, there's just like, you know, elders or people that are involved in the community that go out and speak on behalf of the community, but don't have any uh, title Per se. So when we think about, well, when I think about giving circles, right? And so giving circles are one of those, one of those vehicles of giving where your title really doesn't matter when you come into the circle. Um, um, which you know, it, it was my experience that you know I could be my full self in that group because it didn't matter who had title, who didn't. We all came to the circle. We all you know, we gave the same amount of money, and so we had the same kind of conversation inside of with the money so i mean in this case it's it's a little bit bigger than 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 21 people right but um i still think that when i think about giving circles the opportunity to come and to um, um be a part of the table i don't want to i wouldn't want to run people off who to think it's just for leaders um, yeah that's a really good point um and you know you, i think you hit it spot on with the giving circle idea it's about democratizing the participation as well. So, um, but I also see value in what Seda was saying of like trying to find those community connectors who can help us expand our outreach as well. So, um, yeah, I think it can go both ways. Um, so, in terms of do do we want to talk about timeline and leadership roles, or do we want to talk about more of the membership and minimums, what would you rather focus on first? Are there others who are still interested in, in being part of shaping this who aren't here today? Who may potentially want a leadership role? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can definitely share this document, you know, at the end of the call and the meeting notes and everything like that and allow people to self-identify. Um, so, you know, I think that there'll be opportunity for other people. And what I've seen a lot of the times that, that works well in other giving circles is that there 
co they're, they're really co-chairs and, and working together as a committee, right? So it doesn't have to be one president, one vice president. Um, one of the other giving circles we have has three co-chairs and they split up responsibilities among themselves. Um, so, you know, when it comes to like the secretary role, that could also be something that rotates amongst all the members so that it's a shared position. Um, but then, you know, you want to have like a marketing committee, you want to have a grant review committee. Um, and really the grant review committee should be all the voting members, uh, right? Because they'll see the applications come in, um, they'll be able to place their vote um, and everything like that. So for the leadership committee, if there are people who want to take a more active role um, in organizing this these meetings um, and hopefully getting to a place where the giving circle itself is um, self-functioning. I think that would be exciting. Um, so would welcome, you know, if anybody has a background in marketing or in um, reviewing grants and, and things like that, happy to lend your expertise um, in those specific ways. Um, but to your point, Samantha, like, you know, anybody can can volunteer. Uh, we wouldn't exclude people who aren't in this meeting. We, we'd open it to everyone. And feel free to nominate a fellow colleague if you feel like they would be good for it as well. So we can come back to that one. Um, so Rod, I think you're on mute. Um, I was going to ask if, oh, sorry, um, but um, do we know what the roles of each of the positions are, like what the responsibilities would be? I think that might help clarify. Uh, and then how much time it would involve, like on a weekly or monthly basis. I think that would help to see if we can fit that into our schedule. Yeah, no, those are all great points. Um, so I think the timeline really depends on uh, and the time commitment um, is up to the group here to decide like is this something that you think would suffice with you know quarterly meetings for the entire group but then the leadership committee maybe has bi-monthly meetings right so they're meeting a little bit more frequently um, but all of that is flexible um, but then, you know, the marketing committee, maybe they're coming up with the content for a flyer or a social media post or to promote um, the giving circle. Uh, and the co-chairs are really working on, um, and hopefully all the members, but the co-chairs more specifically, are working on recruitment for this giving circle. Um, So we'll leave the leadership committee um, decision and maybe I can provide some more context around um, positions and descriptions um, for a follow-up email and people can self-identify that way. Um, but I, I'd really love to um, see, I think Rod, you wanted to say something, but we're on mute. Did you wanna oh. share? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. No, I was just um, wondering like, do we, I think it was already asked, you know, do we know, understand the responsibilities behind each role? Because naturally people are going to be hesitant to jump into leadership when we're not sure exactly all that's involved, right? So that's a good point. So I'll, I'll put some clarifying um, information in here under each role. Uh, so I guess... Um, do people want to look at what a timeline could be? Um, you know, we're at the end of April now. Um, if some of these other decisions are made, I think most of, um, you know, the main, the main thing to decide is on like, how much is membership considered at for a vote? Um, that would be a key thing to come up with. Um, 
either today or in the coming weeks. And then the other thing would be the timeline. Uh, so, you know, do you think that you'd want to have membership open until a certain date uh, where people can donate and uh, they can promote the giving circle in their own circles um, and encourage more members to um, to do that. So, what would a good time frame be? Seeing that, you know, if if we decide on leadership in May um, and they have a meeting or two, um, and then kind of become more public facing later in the year, what do you think a good timeline for that strategy would look like? From your from from experience with those um, those who have experience with giving circles in the past, I'm very new to this. It's hard to weigh in, but I, the question for those with experience: How long do these things take? Each of the items that you list here, it varies. Um, it varies depending on how formal the group wants to be or doesn't want to be. Um, I think in this case, since you, you're talking about basically a national, international type organization, you're going to probably need a, a little bit more structure than, say, a given circles made up of, a, of, of community members who live within the same place. Um, I would think when the community investment network um, was being formed, and it's like it's a association of giving circles, um, I think they met monthly for for seven or eight months to put this whole thing together. Um, and they would literally fly in and, and do a weekend face-to-face, -face, um, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday type type deal to, 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 to hammer out everything. I don't know if you necessarily have to be that, that formal um, as much as there are plenty of examples of organizations that, that kind of would that have a structure that would be a, that would fit what we're trying to do that we could borrow from to move forward. Well, I don't believe in recreating the wheel when uh, you know one has already been created. And I think that cuts down on your time. So ultimately, I, I would say it, the decisions like when you start talking about forward facing um, from 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 the group, what is it that whether it's from the branding or the logo, the colors and all those things, and agreeing upon that, you know that stuff. When you start getting down into the weeds, um, I like I like smaller planning groups to figure that all that stuff out because it moves faster. Um, yeah, because you because we've all seen those floor fights over this color of red or that color of purple, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I would say I would say June, July to begin recruitment will be aggressive. Um, uh, and it depends on what you're recruiting for. Are you recruiting to be a part of this planning committee or are you recruiting to be a part of the, 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 the overall circle? Uh, if you're recruiting to be a part of the planning committee, I think you can do that. We have enough information we can recruit and, and continue to build. Um, knowing that, you know, with more voices, that's that's more, more people to manage until you get the structure set up. Um, um, but if you're talking about recruiting to be a part of the circle, I, I will push that back to, you know, you, you're towards the end of the year. Okay, that's good feedback. In the last quarter, in the last quarter, I said the last yeah. quarter. Yeah, this was definitely an aggressive timeline. Um, so duly noted, um, we can make adjustments. Uh, and, you know, whether those minutiae details are going to be for the leadership committee. Um, and And honestly, like you guys have been to like, five, six meetings now, like I really want each of you to be like part of this planning committee in some sort of way. Um, so I would love to see, um, you know, some people either again, self-identify or nominate other people on the call here to kind of say, you know, I think so-and-so should be, um, you know, a co-chair and will be just general members and, and so on and so forth. But 
when it comes to the timeline, then I think if um, we we even spend, uh, let's say, May and June to recruit, or let's say May, the month of May to recruit the leadership committee. Can, can I make a recommendation? I, it's just because we're, I, I, um, I, I think that, you know, we, we have a good group and we could probably develop a leadership committee that we could grow. Um, and then we're going to invite general members in, but I think especially with this subject, it would be nice to have a like um, interfaith advisory committee or something like that, where we could just invite people to from different faiths, you know, to, you know, be represented and um, give us, you know, feedback, background, you know, what um, holidays we should like send out emails for, you know, things like that, like, you know, we should recognize just verbiage and how we in certain communities and things like that, because I'd like it come from the community members rather than just us, but they might not want to serve on a leadership, they might not want to do planning, but they might just want to have some input. So I'll throw that out there to the, the to the general commu committee there. Okay. Is there an already existing type of interfaith advisory committee that we could lean on to, to provide that, that anybody knows of? I wouldn't go to something that's already established because I think we're setting up something new. Okay. New, different, and I, I, I think we're tending towards social justice, and I don't know if there's an interfaith social just, you know, organization out there already, right? So I really think actually we're on the forefront of something rather than, so I'd love to create something that, you know, where people come on knowing that we're gonna, um, you know, social justice is one of our, at least, you know, from what we were talking about uh, is a focus, because uh, I still deal with sometimes with um, more um, traditional community members in different communities that don't effectively believe like, you know, like I said, I'm a DEI trainer, but people say, okay, I, I want to learn about DEI, but don't put justice into it. And it just surprises me that people <laughs> uh, still think that way. So I, I would like to, I think there's an opportunity to create the new. So that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, Saida, you want to go? Yeah, no, I just wanted to concur. I agree. We're, I think this is very groundbreaking. So rather than old modeling that you know, may have just gotten to a status quo and a pat on the back and preaching to the choir. I think this is a beautiful opportunity to, um, as she was saying, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting everyone's names. I apologize, but creating a new. Um, and I think that kind of framing of the social justice and individuals that are already, um, you know, uh, on board that can then accelerate change because we're looking for some impact on the ground, right? We're we don't necessarily want to just purport old models. So I, I agree with what was earlier said. Great. Uh, Ari and then Karen. Yeah, it, it is very exciting to think about um, all of us coming together for something new. And for those of you who have seen this, you, you can see the newness of it. Um, I, I guess I wanna raise the question in terms of the focus of where our giving is and what the identity is. <clears throat> if I think it, when, when we're out there recruiting and when the, the story of what it is we're trying to do is told, it, the more narrow it can be, the better. So like interfaith inclusive of everyone, I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean we should exclude anyone. That's narrow to me, meaning we, we give to a variety of causes but what our brand and our identity is, is that we've come across faith boundaries to do so, or um, we've come across faith boundaries to do so, and we're giving in this very unique area. So I, I missed the last meeting when, when we moved away from hate and the hate and, and sort of brought, broadened it. I see it there listed among others, but when people say, all right, well, what are you guys supporting, right? The name is Giving Circle. The giving is, is a primary identity. I could see 
I think we, we want to be really clear or have like a, if you only have five seconds to talk about what this thing is, you should be able to say what it is. And I wonder if we're too disparate in terms of the targets of our giving, whether that will get lost um, just from the identity. And I think that would matter in recruitment. It would matter in terms of the symbolic impact and power of what it is for us to be together. Uh, I don't have the answer, I'm just raising the question. That's a good point. Um, Karen? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back to um, the kind of interfaith advisory committee. Uh, I work part-time for United Religions Initiative, which is the largest interfaith grassroots peace building organization in the world. Their global office is here in San Francisco. And basically they're already doing that. And so um, I can contact Biff and Diana who are in charge of institutional development and um, development in general. And they should be in this, <laughs> they should be a part of this, um, but that already does exist. And so there's a lot of things we could learn from URI. I did my doctoral project for them. Uh, and so, um, you know, I definitely kind of agree with that that does actually exist. There are people out there already doing this kind of work. Um, it might be a different focus, their organization, but, th but they have it down in regard to the interfaith development funding aspect. And so they might be a great model for us. Yeah, definitely would welcome any and all introductions. Um, so I wanna give opportunity to um, Tabassum and Aziza and Samantha again, just to hear your thoughts. Um, so this, I have no idea why my video is not working. It, it, it's okay. It, it was a, there was a little message that came on saying, uh, give permission for the video or something. And I clicked it and still nothing happened. Anyway. Um, no, it's a great conversation. This is all very new to me. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I mean, I know the traditional grant making for sure, uh, but uh, I've never been part of um, a group that started, you know, organically. So I, I would, my vote would be to, if we have the ability to um, try something new uh, if we think that there is merit in it. Um, yeah, and 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 timeline, uh, time wise, I think um, it's uh, it's good to be realistic, given you know, uh, given everything else. Yeah, so those are those are my thoughts. Thank you. Hi, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm just gonna say, I, I, I came in late, so I feel like I'm missing some important pieces um, and we've shifted a little bit from our last call. So I'm just gonna listen if that's okay. I really fully agree about narrowing our focus and being, being really clear about, uh, which is kind of like where we were sitting last time and trying to narrow down. But um, yeah, I really wanna sit back and take it in. Perfect. Okay. Um, so that gives some clarity into some other things that we can try to develop um, for this as well. You know, I think, you know, even though removing the confronting hate from the name, like it's still very clear in terms of what types of organizations we want to be funding based on this list here. Um, so I think it's still, um, gets um, gets uh, highlighted, um, but we can also again, you know, add it to the purpose section here. Um, provide more on the angle around um, what types of organizations maybe, so we can pull from what we have here and and put it up into the purpose area as well, if that's helpful. Um, okay, so I, I did kind of massage around the timeline to stretch it out uh, through the end of the year. 
Um, so, you know, if we spent next month to recruit more leadership committee members, um, have more faith backgrounds or belief systems represented in the group, I think that's important um, and something that I've hopefully have been saying from the beginning. Um, and then if in that time frame from May until September, the leadership committee takes those three to four months to really focus on the ins and outs of all of this stuff and flush it out more, right? So giving uh, the group some autonomy to come up with what that looks like. Um, and in that process, identifying the leadership of the group so that you guys are meeting on a more consistent basis, that you guys um, are um, organizing around uh, this concept a little bit deeper, but then becoming publicly facing in September to then recruit members to join the giving circle. And again, uh, that's going to be pretty dependent on what we say the minimum contribution will be. Uh, so, you know, we could do it where it's $50 or it's $500 or more or less or anywhere in between. So wherever you feel like um, that should land and provides access and equity to people to participate, um, I would welcome a more thorough discussion on that point. Um, and then from there, um, in September, where did I go? Okay, so then in October, uh, began requesting members to nominate charities. So again, in order to be a recipient of the giving circle, uh, it needs to come from a nomination of a member of the giving circle. So members would be able to nominate charities and invite them to apply. Uh, so that would happen in October. Then the giving circle would review all of the applications in November. Uh, there could be a meeting in November to, you know, maybe there's a dozen charities that are applicants and maybe it narrows down to five. Um, and then those five organizations are invited to a meeting with the entire membership. Um, so kind of coming up with even further bullet points in between this timeline um, would be a responsibility of the leadership committee to come up with what that would look like. Um, and whether it's five organizations or three organizations that end up uh, then presenting based on all the letters of inquiry that are received, um, then in December, we could distribute to the charities. So, you know, that's typically how I've seen the giving circles work. The members will nominate a cause. All the causes will submit an LOI. The members will rank them and say, these are the top three, these are the top five those handful then come and present formally to the entire group. Uh, and then based on that, they are then reprioritized or saying this one will receive uh, X amount, Y amount. And you can say, again, the leadership committee can decide, you know, first place will get 30% of the funds, second place will get 20% of the funds and the rest will get you know, 10% each, or however the committee wants to come up with it. Uh, we've seen some that split 50-50 with the two causes. We've seen others that do 50% for first place, 30% for second place, 20% for third place. Um, so again, all of these are um, up to the leadership committee to decide those details. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Does this adjusted timeline seem more achievable? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, you know, 
do you want to have discussion around what you feel the minimum contributions should be? And this is always tricky, right? Because everybody comes from a different background and identity to their relationship with money. Um, so um, no problem. It would be good here. It would be good here also to hear from those with experience, like what's what's the range, what, what's the range as specific as you want to get? And who does that mean we're excluding from the table or attracting to the table for that matter? Yeah. And yeah, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but I guess we're a giving circle, so we have to have it. <laughs> I would say working uh, from with faith communities at Habitat uh, for Humanity, for me, it's, um, you know, we have set donation amounts for certain things that we do. And at the same time, we will we'll, we'll take the money, <laughs> even if it's a hundred dollars a month. Right. Um, and because that's all. The support. And in fact, right now I'm working with a youth group, um, that goes to a Jewish camp in the South Bay who, you know, they can't afford a $2,000 playhouse donation. So I'm working with them to do something different and, uh, to still give them a day. Perhaps I won't even get paid going out there, but, uh, I believe that, you know, if you're going to set a minimum, um, they, we still welcome anyone who donates. Just because if we are going to be inclusive, right? Uh, then you know, I feel like there that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't exclude anybody. Um, I I kind of leaning into what you were saying, Karen. Um, I would like to. Uh, to propose something and I'm wondering how this lands for you. What if the barrier to enter was just a little bit lower right here so that we can also increase participation and also build. So like, I mean, the, the it, I mean, so I propose this, that we would either have it at the 50 or less, um, maybe even whatever is the biz that is how you enter into the giving circle and then each member gets one vote period, right? So like that way it's a level playing field, nobody can sway. Um, and like you also have access and a voice. I, I love a low barrier of entry, especially for this work. Um, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think this also, uh, you know, um, affords us the opportunity um, to have people come in low, but if we might have certain initiatives, you know, say something comes up or whatever, we can, you know, do like a little initiative and have people donate whatever they want, right? It does, I don't think it needs to just be one way. That's just my thinking. And I know within faith communities, if uh, there's a special project or whatever, people pitch in and, you know, give. So I think if we allow that, like have a minimum, you know, which is very low, but then um, if certain communities want to raise additional money for an initiative or something like that, then they can do that. Yeah, uh, just real to, to put in, in like, I, I think you're right, like, we could still accept larger donations, but you still only get one vote. Totally. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and after, I guess, my experience um, with giving circles, they come in at different ranges when they get started. Um, I've, I've, I've heard giving circles as low as 25. Um, I've heard of some as high as, you know, 1,000 to 2,500. Um, when I joined the giving circle, um, what we did, um, we set ours at 250. And we were all young professionals. None of us could really afford it. But the reason why we've done that is because we knew that there were like 75 people who were around the table doing a lot of talking, but we wanted to see who was going to put their money on the table and actually do work. And so we set it at that high so we could run off and see who was going to stay. And we went from 75 to 21. <laughs> and, and that's, and that's kind of how we got started. So I agree. I think, I think with what we're trying to do, I would, I would keep the bar lower um, as far as the amount. Um, Cause I think, I think more and more importantly is the number of people that are part of this is what gives us as much power as the doc grant dollars that we're, that we're making or that we're granting. Yeah. yeah. The thing about giving circles, 
it is as grassroots from the ground up as you can as you can imagine it um we don't, we don't have to overthink it um it's, it's really as, as organic as, as we as we can make it as we want it as we want it to be um okay and um you know what we can also do is you know those who feel like they have the capacity to give more um we can collect it as a match so let's say you know somebody's comfortable with giving more than that um it could be that we're encouraging more participation because you know now we have a matching grant of you know say 10 people gave more than that and we have a matching grant of five thousand dollars so we're trying to recruit a hundred more members right um to maximize that match so we can get creative with it um you know even our women's giving circle that we just launched in march uh is at 420 dollars um but then um it's anybody can give uh and it'll go towards the collective fund um and we had some women that ended up giving five thousand because they still really believe in the concept of it um but we can set uh set it at 50 bucks that's not a problem um and we can encourage um like i said that matching pool of funds as well any other questions or conversation around around this i i have one more comment Amuhi. i I'm trying to reconcile my um, idea of equitable practices mm -hmm. and being exclusive to being nominated by committee members. And I, I and I don't want to, you know, I know this is very grassroots and um, volunteer based, and I don't want to base it on my <laughs> uh, nonprofit work and RFPs and stuff like that. But I just I, I, I feel like we need some sort of equitable process where um we're open to things that we don't know about um so like i said i don't want to increase the workload i don't want to like accept everything but i i would like some element of um you know being able to accept you know um applications from communities we've never heard from and that don't that aren't represented maybe so i i'm gonna i want to throw that out to the committee and figure out maybe a way that we could do that without increasing the workload and all that so yeah so i so you're saying have it be an open request for proposal process as opposed to member nominated yeah i just don't want to i don't want to have to review like you know 200 applications either but um but i think if it's only people we know then it, it limits the type of you know because there might be some wonderful things happening out there in communities we haven't heard of um and if they hear about this i'd love to hear yeah. about it and maybe fund something like that right so um so, like i said something equitable but yeah. also open but not over <laughs> overbearing where we're doing too much so i think that it'll be challenging to limit the number of applications if it's an open process right and i think really with uh accessible entry at 50 dollars, if uh, somebody really wants to nominate an organization i think that is enough incentive they can see it as like an application fee right um so i i would push back on that and just say that it is very accessible to nominate a charity. It's just 50 bucks to do so, right? Um, how does that sound? So we we could put on there that if you know you you don't currently have a current person, you know that's part. Of, you can join the giving circle to be okay. Yeah. So yeah, I think that 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 sounds reasonable. That that's uh, you know that. Because if you want, like, yeah, fifty dollars is very reasonable. If I feel like I want to apply, but I can't because I don't know anyone, not you know, in the circle, then I can just yeah. give my fifty dollars and hope for the best. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, do we want to have any discussion on, you know, we said in the goals here, fund three to five organization operations annually. 
So do we have a preference of how those three to five organizations, do all five get 20%? If it's three organizations, is it split equally? Again, is it like first place gets more, but second place gets a different amount? Um, because if it's split equally, um, there's really no sense in them presenting to the group, right? Uh, after you narrow it down to those three or five. Um, but if there's incentive around voting in which organization gets the most votes, uh, then I think it makes sense to have this group say it will be three or it will be five. And here are the percentage breakdowns based on the results. So any thoughts around that? Here's my thoughts. Um, one of the giving circles that I've applied to at Liberty Hill didn't have a full presentation. They asked us to submit two minute videos um, and that way it was a little bit easier for the nonprofits. You didn't have to go anywhere. You could describe things or tell your story. Um, and um, uh, that is if we really want needed a presentation. Um, uh, I'm really in favor of less work for the nonprofits, um, sure. and I would do uh, equal in the first, second, third. That's just me. Yeah, I'd lean the other way only because, like, I know when I was new to nonprofits and starting off, that's the way I learned is from our like funders and stuff like that. Um, and the collaboratives and things like that. So just making a pitch and having to do it into three to 10 minutes, whatever we choose or whatever, you know, sets them up to be able to be funded by other people. So for me, it's almost like a capacity building, like, okay, if we give them the parameters and they have to, you know, um, present it a way, it's, you know, they then they learn how to pitch to other, uh, other funders. So I kind of like that, but. I'll leave that up to the group, but that's just from how I learned how to uh, make pitches and you know present to funders and whatever back in the day. Yeah, the LOI process will definitely be as easy as possible. Like you know, we'll ask them a few basic questions. We're not expecting them to fill out essays or you know thousand word responses, um, but really make it a few questions for the LOI. Then when they come into the second round where they're invited and know that they'll be funded, um, whether it's a live meeting um, that they do their presentation to, um, and then there's Q and A and everything like that. It could be like a 15 minute segment per nonprofit, right? So they get five minutes to present, 10 minutes Q and A um, and we do that for the three or the five organizations that are invited. Um, so I think that would make sense. But I think the idea of the videos also sounds good. It's like them practicing their elevator pitch anyways. So they're gonna want to make that as best as they can. Um, so whether they do that in a video format or a live format, I think it'll still come through. Um, Ari, you had something to share? Yeah, less about the uh, less about the presentations, more just a thought about the amounts. Um, I think that they're about who gets who gets what and how much. I think that if you were a grantee uh, of this giving circle, that would be something uh, quite the pride. Maybe something you would list when you were doing other other fundraising uh, in public materials and. I think that means we have the ability to endorse and support. And so in some ways, I like the idea of even numbers because then it's not like, oh, I got first first prize from the giving circle. I got third prize where we would be designating people and they could each say, I was, a, you know, our organization was a grantee or was a whatever it was without the ranking. Um, from that perspective, it makes sense to me to divide up however many gifts we make in equal bits.
And I just throw this out there for food for thought. Um, as we think about, you know, grant making, you know, a lot of times we think about grant making, we think of it in terms of, of, of money. But when you talk about, you know, what I found to be most beneficial from giving circles is, is in addition to grant making money, but it's also um, social capital and intellectual capital. Um, that would also be very beneficial for some of the organizations we might be granting to, because some of them might be just starting up or, or, or just needing that, that type of support. So um, as we think about grant making, um, I just want to remind us we should think about it for more than just, than just money, but it's all of the resources that this type of giving circle can bring to these organizations. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so I'm glad we were able to discuss the, the amount um, so hopefully, you know, um, it being at $50, like we want to have more than just the 10 of us or, you know, that have been joining, right? Because um, we want to see this multiplied and, and really recruit really well for this. So as we wrap up, is there anybody interested in self-identifying to be part of the uh, leadership committee? I, I think, you know, I'm comfortable with all of us being on that as we've been the core group of people who've been joining, but, you know, anybody want to offer in at like a co-chair, uh, splitting up some of the roles and responsibilities, um, organizing, reaching out to the committee members, the doodle, all of that, be my partner in crime. Depending on my next job, whenever that is and where, wherever it comes from. Yes, um, I'm really bad at the whole doodle thing, but otherwise <laughs> I could do everything else. So. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Perfect. I have a few people messaging me directly as well. So great. Um, well, this has been really helpful. Um, you know, thank you so much for keeping the conversation going. Um, we will send a doodle and hopefully um, in late May have another conversation. So with Ramadan ending in, in mid-May, uh, maybe we can try to meet the week of the 17th um, and go from there. So I'll send some dates and you'll hear from me soon. So thank you again, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone.